The thing is that it just forced the fashion industry to change, which it needed to change anyway. So that part of it, I really like because one of the things that I think was bogging people down is thinking that you have to have everyone in your office at all times and that everyone has to be at their desk in their office every day from nine until 7.30 at night. You don't have a nine to five day if you work in this industry. So once I started doing my own company and I started moving around, I realized I can work from anywhere. I don't need to be at my desk all day and I don't even want to be at my desk all day because it's not where I'm the most productive. So I realized that if I go out to a coffee shop or a different place, I have a change of scenery. Sometimes it sparks my creativity and it helps me to come up with ideas that I wouldn't have if I'm just sitting at my desk. So I think that that's one of the things that is really interesting because now people can work from anywhere and you can realize that people can be productive without having to be at a desk and chained to the desk at all times. Emily Bungert is one of the top fashion publicists in the industry. As a young model from Minnesota, Emily moved to New York City after completing her studies to begin her fashion career. After landing an assistant PR role at Vivian Westwood, Emily's career catapulted to new heights. She would go on to work with designers and brands like BCBG, Jeremy Scott, Rag and Bone, Matthew Williamson, Sasson Fide, Mara Hoffman, and Nylon Magazine. The list could go on. You may have seen Emily on MTV's The Hills and Bravo's Kel on Earth when she was working with Kelly Catrone at People's Revolution. After serving as the company's president, Emily moved on to start her own company, EB Consults Worldwide, where she continues to represent some of the top fashion brands in the world. Emily is such a dope human being, and I am so honored that she sat down with me to share her fashion journey. Check it out. Hello. It's great to oh see my you. God. How are you? I'm really well. Uh, so nice what? to see you. It's I know. So long. I feel like I just look at you on Instagram and Facebook and I'm like, oh, like what's Emily doing? What is she up to? <laughs> All the family photos, which I love, like oh. with your family. And I'm just like, oh. That's and you're awesome. having, it looks like you're having so much fun. And I'm like, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> yeah, well, I try to put the fun stuff on there and try not to <sighs> put the icky stuff on there that much, unless I'm really angry. Right. No, which seriously. Occasionally I am. <laughs> hey, <it's> the nature <laughs> of the beast. <laughs> yeah. Holding up, you know, with the pandemic and all this craziness that's happening. Are you in New York right now? I am in Minnesota. <gasps> Minnesota? So, Wait. Yeah. Wait, where are you from again? <laughs> so I'm from Minneapolis. I'm from South Minneapolis. Um, I feel like everyone I meet from Minneapolis or just even different parts of Minnesota are just so like, they're so smart and like, you know, culturally involved, like they know what's happening. They're like woke and like, you know, just on the ground. I'm like, you guys are cool. Like what, like, what is this place? Like, what are they teaching everybody over there? What's in the water? I love that. I know. Minnesota, Minnesota is cool. And Minneapolis is a really cool city. So, Um, yeah, I mean, I was in New York until June, about mid, mid June. And then, and, you know, being locked up in a studio apartment, it just got to be too much after a while. And I was like, I think that I'm just going to try to go to Minnesota and spend the summer there and be with my family and be able to be outside. And so I'm sitting in my sister's backyard, which is currently my office space. And I have chickens. (laughs) There's 
What? Didn't see them? Oh. Oh my God. I love a chicken coop back. We're getting a night. Uh, she actually ordered this fancy new chicken coop, but yeah, there's seven chickens and <laughs> like get the fresh egg. Like, yeah, we get fresh eggs and it's awesome. Uh, she lives in the city, but well, she lives in a su- technically a suburb of Minneapolis, but it's right outside of the city. Um, sort of zone so it and it's about 10 or 15 minutes from the airport so it's a great location and it's where all of my family um a lot of my family is from this area and a lot of my ancestors including my great 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 grandfather are buried in a cemetery about 10 blocks away which is um a part of a church that my great 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 grandfather started no way yeah it was a um a german catholic church that they started in the late 1800s and they had um started they had they came from germany and then they fought for the u.s army in the mexican war and then they ended up getting farmland in Minneapolis, Richfield, Richfield, Bloomington area, which is where we live now. So it's kind of crazy. Yeah, this was, so there's, I have a lot of roots here and sometimes I didn't even realize how many because I recently discovered that all of my, you know, this huge amount of ancestors, cause each of them had like 10 kids and then they had 10 <laughs> kids and like they had, it's a big, big family. And Um, my great grandfather is also buried in that cemetery. So from my, from like the great grandfather, the great, 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 like it's really crazy. Yeah. That's amazing that you can go home, especially during this like crazy time and be surrounded by all that culture and history. Have you sort of been you know, taking this time, you know, or part of it for self-reflection or just, you know, sort of think, you know, people are like, oh my God, I'm like forced to think about my life or what's going on. Like, have you had any new revelations, you know, over the quarantine period, just about your own personal life or work or anything? Yeah, definitely. I mean, when everything happened, my, I mean, my business was affected by this virus since, um, you know, January or even wow. before that, because I was doing a lot of business with people from Italy and China. Wow. So it was like everything, I already started having fashion shows canceled starting at the end of December. Uh, December 31st was the first cancellation of a Chinese show. Wow. And then a couple weeks later, two or three, I had another show from a Chinese designer canceled. And then after that, there were three or four more shows that got canceled and in January. So it totally affected everything that I was doing. And I, and I was watching it really closely since January because I was more in tune with the rest of the world since I was working globally with, you know, one of my clients is global fashion collective. They literally work with designers from all over the world So I was keeping my eye on it and getting really worried. And then um, Global Fashion Collective was able to keep some designers and do two time slots. But in the beginning, we were going to have, I think, three time slot, three to five time slots with each of them are, you know, sometimes three or four designers or some of them are, could be individual shows with one or two designers, but we ended up just with two time slots, which was still good. Yeah. But, um, you know, I had to be at fashion week in February with people from all over the world. And wow. five days after fashion week, I got sick and I was sick. I, I was never able to get a test because I was, um, I was not like deathly ill. I was just right. mildly ill, but it, la- I was sick after fashion week for about three or four weeks. And oh then my again God. in March for another like three or four weeks. And wow. then by April, I started feeling better, but that's when everything was going into complete lockdown in New yeah. York. And wow. I pretty much had 
I had maybe a few little projects left, but almost all of my work got canceled. Wow. So I was at a point where I was just like, oh my God, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent. I don't know how I can live in New York City right now. And that's when I, and then I also was desperately in need of outdoor space. It was starting to be yeah. spring and I could, you know, take long walks with my mask on, but that was about it. So I started to think about going to Minnesota for the summer or yeah. even longer. And then when I basically packed up my apartment and decided to come here and just stay for the summer. And then since I've been here, I've been, um, you know, the first couple of months I didn't do a lot. I just went to the lake with my family. I have been spending a lot of time with my nephew. So and, cute, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the little one is 12 and he just started seventh grade. Yay. And um, his mom, my sister, was working a lot over the summer. So I, she, she decided to take a restaurant job at a place that was doing a lot of takeout business. Yeah. And patio business. And um, she's a teacher, so she oh. wasn't working. So she wanted to make extra money for the summer. And so I got to um, spend a lot of time with my nephew because she was working a lot. So we went to the lake and spent time at my dad's house and, you know, just kind of tried to get some nice outdoor time in. And yeah. then I started working a little bit over the summer. My friend called and said, Hey, um, I'm launching this art project. That's a, an art tour of this giant Afro pick that <laughs> is going to, it's a, it's a 7,000 pound Afro pick and it's called all power to all people by artist Hank Willis Thomas. Do you know about him? Um, no, this oh, sounds you amazing. It yeah. It's really amazing. So the, it's a, Giant Afro pick with a black power fist at the top, and it's my an dad had one back. In the <laughs> yeah, so he built a giant sculpture of it, um, and it's been moving around. And my friend Marsha was um, has a company called Kindred Arts, and she was in she's in charge of this project, producing the entire thing. And she said, "Oh, we're bringing it to Atlanta, and I'm launching an entirely new social media account um, wow. under." for this project and we're bringing it to Atlanta and I just really need help organizing, just getting everything organized for the social media and the launch and the branding around all of this. And so I said, okay, great. And when, when is it launching? Oh, next week. It's of arriving in Atlanta. <laughs> and I was like, ah, so, um, I helped her with setting up the, setting up the social media and starting the posting and getting the account launched and getting all of that up and running. And it was great because it was, I really wanted to do something, um, to make some sort of impact in, in the times that we're in. And after, you know, I'm from South Minneapolis and George Floyd was killed on 38th in Chicago. And I, I grew up on, in that area. I'm from South Minneapolis. I went, was always at 38th in Chicago. I, it's like that moment for me was a really big deal. And I wasn't surprised that Minneapolis was the place that kicked off all of this, but it hit me really personally. And I, I knew that a lot was going to happen and I wanted to be a part of it. And so that opportunity came up over the summer. So I helped work on that and got that set up. And then basically just now have started to rebuild my business and start to have clients wanting to come. And one of the things I realized once I was here was that everyone was working remotely now. Yeah. So I was kind of going, well, you know, I've always wanted to spend more time in other cities than New York, but in the past I really needed to be in New York because I needed to meet with people and be, a, be there. But now that I've been here, I've been having clients wanting to work with me who don't care if I'm in New York. So yeah. I'm able to work remotely. So I decided to stay here for a little while longer because I don't know what's happening with COVID. And yeah. 
I ha- I'm just really happy to be in my hometown and in you know rediscovering Minneapolis, which is a very cool city and it's very different than when I first uh, you know than when I lived here because I've been gone for over 20 years. I've lived wow. in New York. So. What? Yeah. So you went to New York when you were two? Because that skin, <laughs> honey, that skin is flawed. <laughs> I have to get the rundown on the skincare routine because I was like, oh, the pores are looking really nice. There's a nice little glow. Only when I got back <laughs> to Minnesota did I start taking care of myself a little bit. And wow. you know, and when I was in New York, I was just like, I'm not seeing anyone. I was just kind of a disaster health wise. My health was just a mess after being sick for all of those weeks and yeah. having all of these like just fatigue and all of these symptoms that I think are were COVID related, you know, yeah. after I've heard a lot of people talking about after they were sick, that they had all these symptoms for, for months and months. And I really didn't feel well for a really long time. And wow. only recently have I been like, oh, I'm going to, you know, buy some skincare and get a new, you know, skincare routine going. I, I scheduled a haircut. I haven't yes. yet. I'm getting it done. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I've just started to be, to be like, okay, now I can actually take care of myself and, you know, try to do some things for myself that I didn't have time or energy to do. For We're going to take it back a little bit. Yeah. How in the world did you... And uh, first of all, did you want to work in fashion? Was that like a thing for you or did it just like sort of gradually happen? Like, were you like, I'm going to move to New York and, you know, work the shows and, you know, do this or that? Like, what was your vision when you moved to New York? Well, um, I always wanted to work in fashion. I, when I was a kid, I used to make drawings at, of dr- elaborate dresses and outfits and a lot of them were like long, elaborate princess gowns. <laughs> and, or it would be like 80s outfits with like, you know, all of the makeup and neon eyeshadow and hair. Did you watch dude. Gem and the Holograms by any chance? <laughs> yeah. The cartoon? I'm Love obsessed. That. <laughs> Love that. That was an inspiration for one of my designers last year that I was working with, actually, when I was writing the press release. I was watching some of the videos. I love it. But um, yeah, I so I loved, I, I would always draw and I thought that I wanted to be a designer. And, but I didn't know a lot, but as soon as I could get a job, I started working in retail for fashion companies. So my first fashion retail job was for the limited in downtown Minneapolis. (laughs) And then I worked at a nine West store in the same mall in the city center in Minneapolis. And then I got hired at Dayton's, the department store, um, which was nearby. And that was sort of the big iconic department store in downtown Minneapolis. And I started working there in the juniors department, which was the teenage girls clothes, which is what I was wearing. So it was so fun. I loved it. I folded jeans. There were, you know, all the coolest jeans, all of the latest outfits. And I was obsessed with merchandising and I loved folding and merchandising and fixing the racks and making everything look beautiful in the store. Yeah. So I worked there for a long time. And then um, while I was working there, I had people approach me to ask me if I wanted to do modeling. So I was like, oh, cool. So I started working with some of these people. And um, two of the people were these two guys who were doing hair and makeup. And they or they were doing one would do hair and makeup and one was a photographer and i started um doing shoots with them and then wow. they eventually started an agency a modeling agency in minneapolis called vision management and i think it still exists now and it specialized in um diverse casts of models wow so it was the only agency where you could find you know, black models or Asian yeah. models or, you know, a lot of really cool, diverse models. And yeah. their models that they've discovered here have gone, you know, worldwide. So wow. that was really cool. But when I was working with them, they were just kind of starting out and um, they would ask me to do shoots and 
Sometimes they would also ask me to borrow clothes from my own closet to use for their photo shoots. So <laughs> I, they would go, hey, we really need clothes. Would you just put you know, a, a few bags together and we'll, I love we'll pay it. you and we'll come and pick it up and bring it back. And, and so that's where I- so You were like styling. In the industry. Yeah. So I, I did do some styling back then. So I started to do that. And then another person, um, another woman who I met was who also had a modeling agency. Uh, I also met at the department store and she started booking me on modeling jobs here and there. And she was a good mentor. And I also worked as a receptionist at her agency sometimes. And I always had like five jobs when throughout (laughs) high school. (laughs) And then I went to, um, I started college and I was doing fashion buying and merchandising at a college here in Minneapolis. And um, actually before I started, I went to New York when I was 17 and I did Mm -hmm. a program at FIT. They have um, like a summer program for students just in high school or just out of high school who um, were sort of exploring the industry. Yeah. So I signed up for that course and I paid for it myself. Although my, I'm wow. sure my mom bought my plane ticket and stuff, but um, <laughs> I went, I came to New York. I went for, it was for the summer. I think it was about a month and a half. I stayed in the mm-hmm. dorms at FIT. I wow. flew there by myself. I got out of a cab. I had no idea where I was. I had my giant suitcase. They left me out. <laughs> At the time, um, where the door, the street where the dorm was, you know, it's on like 27th Street. Between yeah, something. yeah. The street was closed off, so they just left me there with my giant suitcase, <laughs> and I had to, you know, go walk and find my dorm and everything. <laughs> and it was funny. It was a cool experience. The first time arriving in New York, so wow. exciting. So I took that class over the summer. And then while I was in New York, I had some friends there. My sister was there during part of the time. She had two of her best friends are from Park Slope. Oh, wonderful. She was there sometimes. And then my, one of my best friends from here, Jenny, her brother lived in New York and still lives in New York and at the time lived in Soho and with his wife. And so she would be in New York too. So at, some points I was hanging out with them. I would go to Park Slope. And then I also got to, I met some people and started going to the Hamptons and I didn't even yes. know who was. Yeah, I mean, um, you're and you're then, like, <laughs> <laughs> so I started, so I started going to the Hamptons. I met some people. I met um, a guy who was a really famous model at the time wow. and in all of these really big campaigns that were all over every bus stop at the time. And he became a friend of mine and start, and invited me every weekend to the Hamptons. So Amazing. I just had lived this crazy life while I was there. But one of the things that um, I realized when I was there was um, just how there were a lot of young women that were around me. And they were, I noticed a lot of times them being taken advantage of and a lot of young models being treated um you know not in the way that I liked um yeah. and I was a little bit turned off by it and it made me kind of be like oh I think I'm gonna go start my college career in Minneapolis and mm-hmm. I'm not in New York um which was interesting so I kind of decided to start in Minneapolis and then about a, a couple years into my college my sister decided to move to New York and she was going to go to school. So I said, okay, well, <laughs> I'm going to come too. <laughs> you know, You're taking me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, like, yeah, need I need to go to New York too. So, <laughs> so I kind of tagged after her. And at the time I was working at Nordstrom in the oh, my America, goodness. which I love. Nordstrom <sighs> is one of my favorite companies. What a dream. I mean, it was, um, I actually really loved my job there. I, I loved that the, the salespeople made commission and I was a really good salesperson. I loved making commission and doing sales. So, um, it was a great job, but I, while I was at Nordstrom, I went and got a WWD from the fashion office and I would look in the jobs wow. listings from the printed out copy of the WWD. Oh I, I knew about it. So I would grab the job listings and I found a listing that said they were hiring a salesperson in New York at a retail store that was opening. Wow. So 
I sent my resume and I got an interview. So when I went there with my sister, I did have a job interview and something <laughs> to do. And then um, the job was with a Japanese designer called Atsuro Tayama, who wow. was a very cool designer who was based in Paris, Japanese. Um, and it was run by Itochu Corporation, uh-huh. which is a big Japanese company. And they invested in this brand. And wow. they hired KCD to do the PR. And so anyway, I got an interview and I got the job and I got hired and it was opening on Wooster Street and oh. the party had Helena Christensen. Of course. And, uh, you know, all these amazing people. And I, I, that was my first experience with, you know, seeing what a PR company does. Um, you know, I was hired as a salesperson, but I was uh, interested in in communications and things. And I started to realize what PR people do. And that's when I started, I was, saw them, they would come in and meet with editors at the store. They threw the opening party. They were in charge of, if someone wanted to borrow samples or, Mm -hmm. you know, for a photo shoot and things like that. And I started going, Hey, I could do that job, I think. And so yeah. I told um, the president of the, comp- of the company at the time was based in an office in the store in the basement. Wow. Um, and I was doing a good job there. And I told him that I was interested in PR. And um, he ev- eventually went to start to open a Vivian Westwood store Wow. In New York at the time that Itochu, the same company, was backing. So they were hiring a PR assistant. So he got me an interview to, um, you know, a pre-interview to interview as a PR assistant for Vivian Westwood. Wow. So then um, I did a first interview with a team in the U.S. and I passed that and they said, we want you to go to London. So, um, I, at the same time as this was happening, I also was working in the nightlife industry and I worked as a hostess at a restaurant and nightclub called Moomba, which (laughs) was the hottest place in New York. And at the time, Leonardo DiCaprio was the hottest actor and everyone was in love with him. It was like after Titanic panic and all that. Yeah. And Leo would come every single night to Moomba. And then Lizzie Grubman was doing the PR and she had it in page six every single week. Of course. Leonardo DiCaprio, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. So every celebrity came there. So that was also a really good school of New York for me because yeah. I didn't know what anybody was. And the people who, the two women who were running the reservations and the host desk were these badass women. And they trained me on who everyone in New York was. Love so it. it was like the director of this movie, the editor of this magazine, the, wow. you know, DJ of this, the owner of this company, you know. And the the guest list was pretty much who's who of New York. And you could kind of like Google every single person on the list, you know? Yeah. So I started to, um, I also got that job, by the way, by looking in a New York York Times want ads. um, I love it. (laughs) But hiring a hostess. And I didn't know what it was. I I had no idea what it was. And I walked in there, but I was wearing this outfit from Atsuro Tayama that was purple and black and white printed silk pants and like high heels Cute. and I had a badass like Parisian couture up you know outfit on I love it so I, I got that job so at the same time I was working there I got um invited to go to meet Vivian Westwood in London so I when I met with Vivian, which I was die? more nervous than I've ever been in my life. First of all, I didn't even have a passport. I had to call oh. my mom. She had to send me my birth certificate overnight, UPS. Oh. I had to go to the office, get a passport, get a plane ticket, fly to New York. I mean, fly to London, meet Vivian, you know, the most, one of the most iconic women in the fashion industry. Wow. So, um, 
I don't know why, but she hired me and <laughs> got the job. by the way, I went out the night before I met, I just went out by myself to a restaurant to, uh-huh. I was eating at the bar and the bartender was like, Hey, um, me and some friends are going out tonight. Do you want to come? And I was like, sure. Cause I was in love myself and I didn't of know. Course. So I went out with these people and ended up like all over London for the whole entire night. They wanted to come back to my hotel for an after party. And I was like, I'm meeting Vivian Westwood in two hours, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I, I went out all night long, still went, went to my interview on time, dressed in a Vivian Westwood. That's what PR people do. (laughs) um, I got the job. And then after that, I got to work on my first show, my first fashion show. Um, well, the first three shows that I ever worked on, I got to do London Fashion Week uh, for the Red Label. Yes. Paris Fashion Week for the Gold Label. And okay. then she, and then the New York, she did, I think it was her first show ever at New York Fashion Week. And she wow. in the library at Bryant Park. And that is where oh I my met God. Christina <laughs> <Holtz>. <laughs> Oh my God. I interviewed her a couple weeks ago. It was so much fun. <laughs> so much fun. I love her. <laughs> so, I know. Cause we talk about it sometimes. Cause we're always like, where did we meet again? And I'm like, it was the, the Bryant park library. Yes. Uh, she was the venue manager, I think. Or uh-huh, something. Yeah. I remember. Yep, that and was then, it. So, Oh, by the way, before that show, they decided to use me as the hair and makeup test model and the fit <gasps> model for the show. So I had James Cagliardos doing my um, makeup and Danilo doing my hair. I mean, these are Do we two have pictures? Movies. Like, did you... Did you <laughs> I did have, you have Polaroids of, of it. I, I, I don't know where oh. they are. I think I have them somewhere in my phone or something. They painted my face red and blue. Either the models were either red or blue. Of course. So of my course. entire face was blue and my entire face was red. And then they put the outfits on me and with wow. the hair and makeup, had me walking and everything. And Amazing. so suddenly, uh, instead of paying a real model to be the you know test model, it was me. Wow. So here I am with James Calliardo doing my makeup and everything. So it was a, it was pretty amazing. And that's, you know, that was kind of one of my first experiences. And I got to go to LA for the first time too. And the wow. head of sales took me around to a bunch of stores and we did an event there. And so that was my first um, way to travel out of the country. You know, I got wow. to go to London twice. I got to go to Paris, LA, you know, it was really amazing. And then during that time, I worked part-time at, at Intermix as well on, which was all across the street from the bad boy offices at the time. Yes. I know exactly (laughs) what you're talking about. The girls from the bad boy office used to come and shop at my store, um, and shop with me and stuff. And I, um, some of the girls that worked there, I started seeing them. they would come to the store and then I started seeing them out at parties where I would go where M- Mark Ronson was DJing. Oh my God. I loved going to hip hop parties. I so I Mark. was like, Mark, um, wherever Mark was DJing, I would go. So I would run into these, the same group of girls who were my age, who all worked for Puffy and they were working in marketing. They were organizing Puffy's parties. Wait, did, um, did you, did you ever, uh, meet with Tracy Waples? Was she like, I know she's a little high yeah, up. Yeah. She was like probably their boss or uh, yeah. boss they were the younger girls in the office. Yeah. Were the assistants to like the head. Ah. Of so the head of marketing at the time, what I believe was Josh Takeman, mm-hmm. who, um, whose sister was Allie Takeman. Wow. And so there was a lot of connections there because, so I was working, um, so I met those girls. One of them was jo- uh, Josh Takeman's assistant. And I became, wow. um, I started being at the clubs with them. So we all started hanging out together and they became my friends who are still my best friends to this day. And Aww. they were working for Andre Harrell. Yes. And, Puffy, and all of them. Andre. And Pop. yeah. And so we would, um, we would also go to Puffy's parties every night. We were, they were organizing them. So we were, wow. you know, at the club at Puffy's table organizing, you know, who was on his guest list and all of that. So 
while I was the one working in fashion, my friends were all working in the music industry. And I also got to meet my best friend who was the manager of the Intermix store, Maria. So she hired me at Intermix and she is my best friend to this day. And she works at Fendi now, but she was... Uh. um, she was there. And so we all would, we met all these girls and we all became, you know, friends. And then, um, while I was working at Intermix part-time after I, um, stopped working. Well, I think it was in between. I stopped working at Vivian Westwood because I got a call from Allie Takeman, um, called me at the Intermix store. And she Mm -hmm. said, I heard about you through April Hughes, who at the time was a market editor at Elle magazine. Yeah. And I, in April used to shop with me at the store and she knew, she knew me because we met at London fashion week at a Vivian Westwood show. I brought her to her seat. So she knew that I worked in PR and I also worked at Intermix and Allie was hiring a PR assistant at Betsy Johnson. And Allie was also Josh Takeman's sister. Oh, my God. (laughs) Completely random from that. April told her about me and she called me at the Intermix store and said, I was wondering if you would come in for an interview because April told me about you and I'm hiring an assistant, you know, a PR coordinator at Betsy Johnson. Wow. And I said, yes, absolutely. I would love to interview for this job. Uh, Yeah. So then I got hired as the PR assistant, the PR coordinator at Betsy Johnson. Wow. And um and then Allie, then I discovered that Allie was Josh's sister and that Josh was the boss of my friends. And so it was just so crazy. And then the small um, world she used Mark Ronson as the DJ for her fashion shows as well. Wow. So then I got to be I got to know Mark and his business man his manager, Damon DeGraff, who's still a very good friend Amazing. of mine now to this day. Who and um so yeah and then I was working for Betsy and that was so <sighs> fun and so amazing. She used to have me model for her as well, even though yes! we are. But she would say, Em, come in here. And she would have me try on the craziest outfits. I would be wearing, you know, hot pants and high heels and gay <laughs> tops. And she would go, okay, come on, let's go show everybody in the office. And, you know, walk that is hilarious. I love it. Outfits. She used me as a fit model for a lot of her shows. And I also got to work on the Playboy Playmates fashion show. Shut the front door. Playmates as models, the entire cast. It was totally insane. I mean, that fitting, though. It's it like that so fitting. <laughs> so perfect for Betsy. And for, and for me, I loved it because they were. They were models that the happiest models to be at a, in a fashion show of course. I've ever in my life. Whereas, <laughs> you know, regularly models are like, oh, whatever. You know, they go from show to show. They don't care. These girls were like, oh my God, we're here. Yes. We're here. Modeling at New York Fashion Week for Betsy Johnson. Wow. And we were in the Bryant Park tents in Amazing. the biggest tent. And that was so cool. So yeah, so I worked with Allie and Allie became my mentor um, wow. in PR. And eventually she started um, a PR company within a big production company at the time, fashion show production called Rand M. Yes. And absolutely. Rand M produced like Jeremy Scott, BCBG, yeah. Betsy Johnson. They were our producers. They produced like every big show. And so they had this huge space in Soho um, and they eventually uh, decided to let some of it out as a showroom. So Ali started a little showroom and a PR company there and asked me to come work with her. And she called me and said, you know, I'm doing 15 shows, you know, can you come work for me? And I was like, Oh my God. 15, 15. you know, totally. So yeah, when she did that, I I went and we started to work with Matthew Williamson from London. Oh, I love Matthew. Yeah, that was amazing. I am still so nice. And I 
so uh, sweet, so, so kind, nice, the coolest people, the most beautiful stuff. Yeah, so I got to work on that, and then Luella Bartley was yeah. another client, and she was so cool. And I think, and then she went on to eventually work for Marc Jacobs. Mm -hmm. uh, or design, I think the accessories for Marc Jacobs, but she was super cool. And she was working with Katie Grand as her stylist. Oh, wow. Yeah. And Katie Hillier worked for her and Katie Grand was her stylist. And, you know, so it was major. The models were major. The bags she put out were incredible. So we were doing that and we, and then we did BCBG and we did, Jeremy Scott shows and that was the first time I met Jeremy and Pablo. Wow. Which, um, so eventually when I worked at People's Revolution, I worked on Jeremy Scott and I knew uh. so I already knew them and worked with them prior to my position at People's Reps. Podcasts are awesome. And I know you love them too, or you wouldn't be here right now. But have you ever thought about starting your own? Don't worry, you don't have to be a techie, but you do need a bit of guidance so you don't make costly mistakes. My name is Sunny, and I've been podcasting for a long time. I've launched more than 15 profitable podcasts, and I'm the founder of the Independent Podcast Network. My online course, How to Launch Your Profitable Podcast in 30 Days, gives you the keys to the five P's of podcasting, which is everything you need to launch and grow a successful podcast. You get unlimited access to more than 35 videos and dozens of handouts. And when you purchase my course, you're also supporting this awesome podcast because they're getting 50% of the money when you use their special link. How cool is that? Let me help you get started with your podcast. Go to podcastsareawesome.com slash fashion. That's podcastsareawesome.com slash fashion. Oh, How'd you end up there? How'd you like, what did Kelly give you a call? Well, she's yeah. like, I want that girl. Oh, my team. You did. <laughs> That's how she found me. Um, I, so after Rand M, I worked for Denise Williamson showroom and uh, in PR and I was doing, oh, yeah. um, I did, I launched rag and bone. Stop. Yeah. That was you. Yeah. So <laughs> I produced, um, with Rand their first ever fashion show that they ever did oh and um, got them their first feature articles in Harper's Bazaar and Teen yeah. Vogue and, all the places and brought them to Vogue for the first time wow. and everything. And I was also doing Sass and Bide, which was oh, yeah. a fun Australian label. And I, yeah. and I also got to go to Australia when I worked there, oh. which was amazing. Wow. And I was a guest of the Australian consulate oh. and got to be, you know, taken all over and, hosted by them and then got to go to Sydney and Melbourne. Oh, love. And I also, while I was working for Denise, got to go to Sao Paulo um, and do a sort of trade event there, which was really wow. cool. And I also got to work at Milan Fashion Week for Men's Fashion Week. Wow. Or um, a designer called Oliver Spencer. And Beautiful. Yeah. I have I, all gorgeous. these names. I'm like, oh, yes. Yeah. So I worked there. Um, that was awesome. And while I was working there, <laughs> I got a call from my friend Robin Berkeley, who I worked Robin. with. I, I yes. missed a little stint in there when I was telling you my, my past. I worked at LaForce and Stevens for a little while after I left mm. Betsy. And I loved LaForce and Stevens. It was really uh, cool. It was a much more corporate agency. Uh -huh. um, but Robin Berkeley was working there at the time as an account executive. No and way. She, uh, Patrick <laughs> McGregor was. Oh, my God, Patrick. Now. And he was. Um, Shut up. <laughs> 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 yeah. So I was working with pa Robin. And hey, Patrick. Patrick. Hey, Robin. <laughs> yeah. So, who I love both of wow. them. Um, so that was really cool. I loved working there, but I left there for a little while because I decided because my nephew Daryl, who's now eighteen, was wow. born. Um, I decided to go spend time in Minnesota for a little while in between, just while he was a he was one year old, so I mm -hmm. could get to know him because I felt bad that I didn't. You know, I wanted to be close to him and get him to know me. And I wanted him when he sees me to, to know who I was. So yeah. 
Um, I did, I spent, a, so I had to quit working at LaForce and Stevens, but James LaForce was my boss and he was really nice about it. Mm-hmm. And he, he was always really nice to me and great to work with. And he understood that I wanted to spend time with my family and everything. Yeah. And then be, instead of going back to work there, Allie recruited me to work at Randam. So that mm. was how I kind of came back because she called me in Minnesota and said, I have 15 shows come to help, me. help. And I said, okay, fine. You know? <laughs> so anyway, um, after I was working at Denise's and I knew Robin Berkeley, Robin started working eventually at a company called People's Revolution with Kelly Catrone. And she would call me and, and say, Hey, Kelly saw you working at fashion week. And she said, who is that girl? I I'm knew it to come work for me. <laughs> and I, w- and I said, what? I've never even met yeah. Kelly. And she said, no, she saw you and she keeps asking me about you. And she, and I said, that's so weird, you know, <laughs> but so uh, Kelly. <laughs> yeah. So I went and met with them and I got along really well with Kelly and she wanted me to come in as a partner because Robin was a part, her partner at the time. And Robin w- had just so much going on, too much yeah. going on and needed another senior person. So I came in there, um, and started, she brought me in sort of as a director and a partner in the company. Um, and then I just started running accounts there and that, and then I got to work again with Pablo and Jeremy and work yeah. on those. And then, started working on clients there and eventually got to work with Mara Hoffman. Oh, who love. I love. Um, oh, take my money, Mara. Yeah. That, oh my gosh. I, I was a huge fan of her clothes already. And so I got to work on that account. I loved it. Oh my she God. It was amazing. And that's when I got to go to Miami swim week and yes. work with the IMG team. And um, I produced her shows for five years in a row and wow. Miami Swim Week and, um, and every season she got bigger and more famous. And by the last show that I did with her there, we were the Mercedes Benz presents sponsored mm-hmm. designer and it was wow. the biggest show in Miami Swim Week. And so that was a really fun project and something that I loved working on. And yeah, so eventually I was given the title of president at People's Revolution. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know you got that. Yeah. Okay, Emily. Um, <laughs> how long were you there? <laughs> Ten years. No, yeah, I was like, wait, how long were you? <laughs> it's been a minute. <laughs> a long time. I also, while I was there, got to work out with Nylon Magazine as a client. Oh yeah. And oh really? Amazing. Yeah. So oh, wow. I would do a lot of the, the events for them in mm-hmm. LA or New York or Coachella, Lollapalooza, mm-hmm. things like that. And I would, um, as a client, I worked on their, so I would do the events and I would help book all of the talent that would attend point oh, one, yeah. do all of the guest lists, reach out to the press that would be covering the event and doing the red carpet, schedule red carpet interviews and work with the talent reps for the whoever the celebrity was that was uh, featured on the cover. So I got to do Zac Efron a couple of times, hey, Olivia Zach. Wilde, Florence Welch from oh, the Machine. That must have been amazing. Shirley from Garbage. Um, Wait, what? Can can you repeat that? Can you <laughs> yeah, repeat that? Yeah, yeah, I got to do Shirley from Garbage. You know, I live I mean, for her. Like, I live. Major. Guess who else I got to work with? Lana Del Rey. Ah! She's she's basically, like, flawless, I've right? Like, was she just magical? When was I she did just an magical? Event. Oh. She had people outside. We did it at the Sunset Marquee Hotel in L.A., and she had people outside trying to get autographs signed, you know, from lined up before anything. And uh-huh. I mean, I've never seen anything like it, honestly. I wow. worked with a lot of celebrities. Oh, I got to do Paul Rudd uh, event. I love Paul. He was so nice. I'm sure people so... just spew lines at him nonstop, like from all the movies. And I also got to meet <laughs> Leah Michelle, and I was a big fan of Leah. Oh, and when I met her, she said, I know you. I saw you on Kel on Earth. I used to watch Kel on Earth. Shut up. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, this is Leah Michelle. Um, she and knows who I am. What, what, what is Kel 
on earth for the <laughs> audience, you know, for those who don't know. So what is it? Kelly Catron <laughs> got a TV show on Bravo, which was a docu-series where they filmed eight one hour long episodes with Kelly and the team working with her, and which included me. So everyone in the company that wanted that wanted to work at People's Revolution had to be on the TV show. Wow. And if you didn't want to be on it, you had to quit, basically. Wow. But um <laughs> It was a cool experience. I mean, at the time, I I had also become familiar I, familiar with TV production because Kelly was also on MTV on the Hills. Oh and yes, she had asked me to, and then she had me appear on the Hills as well on MTV. Oh my god, I have to find now. that episode now. I gotta find so, that episode, Emily. <laughs> You're like, please don't, please. Don't. <laughs> I mean, it's funny. Actually, um, because, you know, Lauren Conrad eventually on the show worked for People's Revolution. I was the one who asked her to come work with us on the show because Whitney Port was working in our L.A. office on on the show. So um, I had to participate in that. So I had already been doing some TV stuff and then we started filming for Bravo and they filmed us every day at work and it was excruciating at times because you couldn't play music and I used to like to play music at at my desk and you know have like a vibe going and when the crew was there we weren't allowed to play music and we hardly wanted to talk because everything that we would say they would like zoom in on us yeah Um, it was it was an interesting experience I I certainly, when I actually have watched back some of the episodes and they're really (laughs) funny and I, I'm like, okay, at least we have all of this crazy, insane stuff that happens. Yeah. Documented a little bit, you know, the way they edited and chopped it up and made it into weird stuff. But the things that happened really did happen and were totally insane. And so they were all captured on video and and actually, people should go and watch it. I don't know where you can watch it right now, but it has been at times on Hulu and Netflix. I'm going to find it, and I'm um, going to put it in the show notes for everyone so we can all relive the bad. It, it is entertaining. <laughs> it's certainly entertaining. It's funny. The y- Some of the younger kids in the office got a lot of attention for their little dramas that they had going on, too. Yeah. They would be crying in the office, and... and um we you know, know the role stuff going on and actually Andrew Serrano yes was, um at People's Revolution and Andrew Serrano was on Kel on Earth as well uh-huh. and he also ended up going to work for IMG yeah after, eventually after that so that was funny but I always had a good relationship with him and he was great I love it. um I but love yeah it. so I I was on uh television as a part of my job. <laughs> so it's so funny. I think that was around the time uh, that the book came out, right? Like if you have to cry, go outside. And she would literally, <laughs> I mean, honestly, like, you know, you know, we know because, you know, you work in it, I've worked in it. It's high pressure. Most people look at it and they're like, Oh my God, this is so glamorous. You're so lucky. It's so amazing. Like, What does it take, honestly, to be successful in the business, in fashion PR? Like, what does it take? I mean, obviously, you see the dramas on TV, like reality TV, whatever. But, like, what is the actual reality of doing well in that that space? I mean, I had to be a really hard worker. I, I dedicated my entire life to my job. I was, I, if I had to be there 24 seven, I would be there. You know, there were many times where we were, we were working until three or four in the morning at, and you know, we were the first, I had to be the first one there and the last one there. I always wanted to work really hard for my boss and do the absolute best job that I could do. And you also had to develop a tough skin because you know, you're going to be rejected left and right by journalists. You, you as a PR person are pitching a journalist. They might say, don't contact me again. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Ever. I'm not interested. <laughs> uh, if you're even lucky that they even respond to you, yeah. you know, and for a long time, I, you know, I, it takes a lot of building up a reputation because in the beginning of my career, 
I would get emails back because I worked for Vivian Westwood and Betsy Johnson, you know, and LaForce and Stevens. And I worked for these great agencies. So I started to be able to make a name for myself. And, you know, I wanted to be able to go from a place to place. And I worked at places for a long time, but people started to know my name. So if I reached out to them and could go, hey, it's Emily Bunger, a journalist might pick up the phone. Right. And that takes a lot of time and effort to get anyone to even, you know, acknowledge you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and a lot of people get, if you're very sensitive with your feelings, you're going to go, you're going to get shot down a hundred times. And so you can't even survive in this industry. I mean, I saw a lot of people that were my interns that went by the end of their internship went, you know, I realized the job is not for me. <laughs> and I, I, went, I know because, you know, you have to be, have a certain type of personality and you have to have a lot of drive, a lot of determination and a lot of, you know, just being able to take a hit and keep rolling with it. And I would just go, I don't care if someone doesn't like my email or doesn't <laughs> want to write about my story or whatever. I'm going to go on to the next five or 10 people and see if they want to cover it, you know? Absolutely. But, but um, one of the things that also helped me is I have I had developed a very good uh, memory. Hmm. So when, uh, when you're a PR coordinator and assistant and you're starting out, you have to have so much attention to detail because there's so many little things. So I, for instance, started memorizing the names and the spelling of the names of every single editor in the, oh, yeah. almost in the world, everyone who would be on my list. I would know how to spell a Japanese editor's name. I would know how to spell, you know, people from all over the country and I would memorize these spellings. So if I could look at a guest list, even now, and I look at a list of people's names, if I saw a name spelled wrong, I could spot it immediately. Yeah. And I also memorized all of the, the phone numbers. At the time, I had a, a sheet in front of my face. I knew the phone number for every single market editor in, in New York. If what? you wanted me to call the market editor at Vogue, I would be like, 286-2860 or whatever. <laughs> I knew their phone numbers. I knew their direct lines. I also knew the address for every single magazine in New York. So if I was doing, you know, and I got to know these by sometimes at the time we did printed invitations. I had to look at every single envelope and I am so (laughs) detail oriented. I would look at every envelope. If my interns put the stamp on funny or there was a uh, name spelled wrong, the address wasn't right, I would pull out that envelope and go, fix it. Yeah. This this person's name is spelled wrong and this is, you know, this doesn't look right. The label is off. It needs to be perfectly straight. The, you know, everything needs to be a certain way and everything needs to be perfect. And I cannot have an invite going out to somebody that's messed up because it reflects badly upon us. And we're supposed to be in communications. And our job is to make sure that we represent this designer or this brand in the absolute best way. And we're putting this out to the world. If we send something spelled wrong to a journalist and they put that into a magazine spelled wrong, that's our fault. And the designer is going to go back to us and go, why is my name spelled wrong in this magazine? Yeah. You know, and I, if I spelled it wrong in my press release, it's my fault. Yeah. So, you know, these things, you could make a small error, but it could end up being in a magazine and it's always there and you can't fix it. (laughs) You know, it already went to print. (laughs) Now a lot of stuff is online. I'll just send them an email and go, Hey, you spelled this wrong. Fix it on the link, you know, a new link. Um, but you know, you had to be very, very detail oriented. You had to be able to spot. And so those things that I learned as an assistant, obviously transferred over when I became a boss, I would be able to know what to look for. And, and I would always, you know, make sure everything was absolutely perfect. And I'm, and I knew who the people were. I know where they're going. Mm -hmm. I know everything. And when I'm doing an event, it's the same, you know, it's every single detail. What do the invitations look like? Who's the photographer that's shooting it? Yeah. What, uh, what is what's on the menu? You know, we have to print Ugh. a menu with the right things. What's what are the menu items? What logo is being put on the menu? Who's on the invitation list? What press are we going to have covering this? You know, what are the goals of the event? Yeah. What celebrities are going to come. You know, we have to call. We have to get celebrities to come. We have to get you know influential people there. 
we have to make sure that the drinks are right. What kind of, you know, what are the drinks being served in? What, what are the drinks? What about coat check? What about, you know, yeah, no, absolutely. Details. <sighs> and when you're doing, you know, 10 fashion shows and you have a team that you have to build as a producer, you have to build these teams together and you have to know every single thing that's going on with every single show at all times. And so, you know, I would have detailed charts and grids and go, you know, for this show, hair and makeup by, nails by, yeah. photographer, videographer, invitations due by, you know, press release, and have all of these lists and checklists and and go back and, and check them again and again. And and when people were working with me who were not detail oriented, mm. I would be too far ahead of them and I just couldn't I can't. You know. Nope. So nope. Um, you can see some of those struggles that I have on Kel on Earth, by the way, because <laughs> uh, the look on your face, the wrong postage <laughs> on there or whatever, you know, and I'm like, ah, so I mean, it's, it's funny, but, it, but I still. loved, you know, I loved the job so much and I knew that it was the right thing that I was doing. I had the best time because even though it's a lot of grunt work, it did ha it has its glamorous moments. So when you end up, you know, you might be working until three in the morning and you're schlepping all of these things, you know, sometimes <laughs> after you get, you're getting ready for a show or after an event, after a show, you're picking up garbage, you know, I oh. might be going, Oh, the, all of these glasses are everywhere. There's hair, pieces of hair. There's pizza boxes. You know, if we don't have a cleaning crew coming in, I'm cleaning it up because no one else is there. Yeah. You know? And you have to be able to do any kind of job. I mean, even as a boss or as an assistant, as a boss, you can pick up that glass too. Or, you know, I Absolutely. always want to set an example for the people that I'm working with to go, I can do this job too. So, you know, all of us should be doing it to go, yeah. you know, you have to show and set an example and go, I'm the host of this event. I'm in charge. I'm the one who needs to make sure everything looks beautiful. If yeah. people are leaving nasty, dirty stuff around, I'm going to go clean it up and make sure it's gone or, you know, make absolutely. Sure right. If some, it, and when you're the point person on an event, if anything's wrong there, everybody comes up to you. So, you know, oh, there's, there's not enough lighting <laughs> here. Can you, pick, you know, get the lighting fixed? Okay, let me go get on top of that. You know, whatever it is, the staging isn't right. You know, where's yeah. the, the team? When you're managing a fashion show, you have to have a front of house and a back of house team. You know, where are those people? How are you managing them? You know, it's just a lot. It's hard to put a PR job into a, one category because it's not. It's it, PR is so broad because we do so many things that you would just never even realize how many, how many things we have to do. Never. How many never. details go into these campaigns and these projects that we're, we're working on. So they're the ultimate project managers in every sense of the word, like across the board, you have your hands and everything. And, you know, you mentioned just, you know, being a boss is like hard, like managing people. In my opinion, sometimes it's just like really annoying. I'm like, you know, what? like let's all get on board here. Like, it's like, you have to motivate people to do things. So I'm curious, you know, from your years of being a boss, like what is the key lesson that you learned in being like a, the most effective manager and, and really motivating people to be their best? Like what, what have you learned and like, how do you implement that in your, in your current career? Um, I think it's just con connecting with your team and being, and, and making sure that you're all on the same page and, and feeling like you're a team and it's not like, I'm your boss, you're my assistant. You know, it's like, we're all working on this together and, making them feel like, you know, I'm so invested in this, in this job or this project or this show that I'm doing in, that I'm trying to make sure that that goes over to my team. So they, they know that we're trying to put on the best 
event or the best show that we can possibly do. And you want to get them excited about it and get them into it too, to go, we're all in this together. If this event is a success, this this is a success for you as well as an assistant, as an account executive, as a manager, you know, whatever, we're all in this together. And I think it's just really important to connect personally with your team and try to, you know, the best teams that I've had, the best people that I've had are still friends of mine now. You know, they're people that I've had really good connections with that we did the best work. I think, you know, are people who I still am in contact with and still am friends with and, you know, didn't, want them to feel like, oh, you're my boss. I don't want to know you. Right. You know? Yeah. I'm like, I let's all like hang out together. Let's all have lunch together. Let's let's all be in this together so that we're, you know, if one person falls off, like we all fall off. We, yeah. we all have to be in this together. And I think that's really important. And it's it took um, you know, it's always been challenging. I've learned a lot as over the years and I just try now more and more to be compassionate about yeah. how they're feeling and how, how, um, what they're doing is going to benefit their life and their future while they're moving throughout their career. And, you know, trying to be a mentor for people to go, yeah. Hey, you know, if you need advice or how, you know, what are your goals? What do you want to do? what do you want to do after this? If someone wanted to leave, I don't like this job. Well, what do you want to do? You know, maybe yeah. I can help you and get a different job, you know? And I think as PR people, we're naturally connectors. So if we know that a worker is good and they're going to do an awesome job, we're going to try to get them a job somewhere else. And, Absolutely. and then the people who hire them are going to be grateful to us to go, Oh my God, I can't believe you sent me that awesome person, you know? Yeah, that's typically how it works. You know, it's so interesting that um, I think just for my my own experience, what I had to really work on was realizing that not everyone thinks like you do, like in terms of like taking the job seriously. I'm like, you know, when I started, I was, you know, and it's like not everyone, you know, I was, I was working for free at times, but I didn't care. Like I wanted to be there and I gave it my all. And so if I got an intern that was just kind of like, nah, 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 I'm like, do you know what this opportunity, you know, <laughs> like, you're just going to like, come on, like, go for it. And they're like, oh, you know, it's not quite there. So I had to remind myself, like, not everyone thinks, you know, like you and not everyone is motivated by the same thing. So finding that and like making it all sync together. is like, yeah, I mean, I tried to find the people I would kind of just try to get to know who the people were coming in try to identify who I thought would be the best person for my team out of the groups of interns. And then I would go, okay, you're with me. And then <laughs> I would go, everyone sit right here. We're going to all do this together and, you know, make them really feel like they're part of a project because at, you know, at people's revolution, there were a lot of interns and a lot of people coming in and out all the time. So I would try to grab like, the one, the smartest ones. And, and yeah. a lot of them that I trained are now onto really successful careers. So wow. uh, that's one of my favorite things is seeing people that I trained and I, and that I know that I gave a lot to and seeing them be successful now is one of my favorite things about my career. I mean, I just that. watching, being able to have given people experience. And a lot of my interns told me that they learned more at their internship with me than they did in their college. Wow. You know, and that they, they brought, took more out of that internship than they ever imagined that they would. And I have a lot of cards that they wrote me at, at the end of their internship that I still kept because I, I value that so much and being able to help somebody or, you know, that doesn't mean I haven't been a pain in the ass boss too. Of course, <laughs> some people probably hate my guts. I don't we know. We all have but our days. If you didn't put the postage on right, if you don't know how to spell and you don't know how to write, don't work in PR, you know? I would have people come in and I would go, how do you feel about your writing skills? Oh, I, I hate writing. I don't want to write. And I'm like, what are you doing in here? Like, At least they you were cannot honest. work in PR unless you... Uh, know how to write and are interested in writing and realize that you are, that this job is to be a communicator and you have to write. So when I would have people coming in going, I hate writing. I'm like, what? 
Wow. You know, so <laughs> I would either just not work with them or, or say, you know, go get it, do something else. You can't, <laughs> You can't come into a PR office and say you don't want to write, you know. I love it. No, I love it. You know, it and it's crazy. I mean, you were there at People's Revolution for so long. Like what shifted and sort of inspired you to do your, you know, start your own company? Was there like a shift? Not really. I mean, I I think it was probably while Kelly was really busy with her TV career because she eventually started doing America's Next Top Model. Oh and yes. So she was gone a lot. So I was I was the person managing all of the accounts. Mm-hmm. So once I was doing that for quite a while, I realized, okay, I'm the one managing these accounts. So why couldn't I do this on my own? And yeah. eventually I just got to a point where I was like, I just feel like I need a change and I feel like I can do my own thing. I don't know what it's going to be yet. I, mm-hmm. I didn't know when I quit, I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do, but I had already started a social media company. Oh, wow. With, yeah. Um, and then that was with Stephanie Skinner. And then yeah. and I decided who was um, my, my former coworker at people's revolution. We love you, Stephanie. Yeah. I love her so much. So she's awesome. So we had started this little social media company and then we kind of took that and created a new company. And then people, as soon as I left, clients started calling and asking wow. me to do things. And, and then they started asking me to do show production and asking me to do PR. So, um, it, it became, it kind of started as social media and became, you know, mm-hmm. PR and production too, because that was what was coming in as business. And so, it was, um, it just kind of happened really fast and got really busy really quickly. And then everything was really crazy. And then, um, but it was exciting, you know, it was starting a new thing and being able to realize that I can do this on my own and that clients want to work with me and are are coming to me saying, you know, well, I wanted to work with you. So that was really exciting and really cool. And I just really didn't know what it was going to be. It just Mm -hmm. ended up being, you know, I I named it EB Consults uh, after my name and it's EB Consults worldwide because I wanted to work with clients from all over the world. And I, I did, and I do. And Stephanie left after, um, a couple of years into the company, she decided to leave and Mm -hmm. change, do a pivot and work in the hospitality industry. But I decided to keep doing it. And I just wanted to, and then I decided as a part of that, while she was leaving, I wanted to just be able to work more independently so that I could move around more and be a little bit more free to, to do my own thing. And kind of, if I wanted to go work in LA for a while, go work in LA for a while, or, you know, kind of to move around more. So instead of having, you know, a PR showroom, which I kind of was at the time, I turned it more into a consulting company so that I would be able to consult and just not have to have a set of samples there. And I can do projects and I, I still do fashion show production in front of house for fashion shows. And one of my clients is global fashion collective and Vancouver fashion week. And Oh, really fabulous. Awesome. Yeah. And so wow. I work with them and they're great. And they want to come back to New York in February. And, you know, my other clients are kind of resurfacing and people are starting to do things again. And I've started, people wanting to start new projects. So I feel like the energy is much better now and that things are going in the right direction. And I'm really excited about the future of everything. And I started to do more social media management while all of this has been going on because, um, you know, PR wasn't really happening for months and social media was, and social media is how people are finding out about things nowadays. And, and because I have that experience, I decided, why don't I just start doing social media management for people? If they Perfect. need to run their Instagram account or to create a strategy around the social media for launch or a campaign. And after doing it for the All Power to All People project over the summer, so um, awesome. that gave me a lot of tools and a lot of kind of refreshed my social media skills. And um, now I'm being hired to do more social media management. 
Amazing. I'm like, yeah. So, well, I mean, can you tell us what's going on with this algorithm? Can you like throw over like, you know, a dollar's worth of uh, advice with this Instagram algorithm that everybody is (laughs) complaining about? (laughs) It changes all the time. That's the problem is you have no idea what's going on because everything constantly changes. So all I can do is just try to keep up with the trends, try to see what's going on, try to learn how to use real Try oh to, my god, like, real. You know, now I'm like TikTok everything's on reels. TikTok, no one's asked me to do yet, thank God, because I have wow. no idea. But I, you know, how to manage that. I, I'm on um a management app for the, a social media management app that I use, has a Facebook group, and I saw someone write, <laughs> Hey, um, has anyone had clients asking them to do a project, you know, to do TikTok and what Ooh. What platform or what management tool are you using? And it was crickets because no one had any answers. So I feel, you know, that's something that's new. But I, I try to stay on top of the trends. I need I know what's going on. I love the TikTok um thing where you can jump into an outfit and I've been Isn't seeing how wild? people are using that and I don't know how to do it yet, but I'm working on figuring it out. Girl, me too. I'm like, what? How are people doing these things? It's so cool. So I love to see it. I love to figure out how to do it. I try to stay on top of the trends. I, I'm just doing, doing my best to try to see what's going on with social media since it's always changing, but you know, there's also always people that are going to need PR and I feel like PR and communications is really important right now because people don't really know what's going on with brands. So you really have to try to connect with customers. And because the stores have have been closed, you have to connect directly with your customer. And the best way to do that right now is through social media or through, you know, marketing, Mm -hmm. email marketing, or different ways that you can connect directly with people. So I've been doing, you know, over the summer doing digital media classes, learning about a lot more about things like Google Analytics and yes. and MailChimp and wow. all of these things and, you know, using management platform tools. And I used some of the time that I had when I wasn't working as much to learn new skills and hone my social media and my digital management skills so that if someone comes to me and wants to you know, digital management for their project. I don't have to outsource it. I can do it. I love it. I love it. I've been doing the same thing. I actually, I, Google has the Google digital garage and it's like a free certification and it's like 40 hours or something. And I just like, boop, 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 boop. I was like, I have, you know, I have extra time. So let me yeah. see what's going on. And it's so, I mean, there's just so much information and technology is just like changing. It's just, I mean, the marketing capabilities online now are just like, they just keep growing. It's like, what in the world is going on? So now that we're in, you know, this pandemic is happening, like you mentioned, it's all so important. So I I do have a question, you know, (sighs) people are like freaking out you know, uh, the fashion community, like, oh my God, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, people are like, oh my God, fashion is dead. Fashion week is over. Like, you know, there's no future. So like, and like, what, what do you think about the future of fashion and sort of where it's going? Like, is it going to continue? Like, what are your thoughts? Because people are freaking out. And by the time this comes out, it'll be right before or during um, Fashion Week in February, if that happens. (laughs) Well, fashion is not dead. Uh, People need clothes. People are always going to need clothing and people need things to wear. And the, the thing is that it just forced the fashion industry to change, which it needed to change anyway. So that, that part of it, I really like, because one of the things that I think was bogging people down is thinking that you have to have everyone in your office at all times, you know, and that everyone has to be at their desk in their office every day from, from nine until seven 30 at night. If you're in New York, you know, you don't have a nine to five day if you work in this industry. So Um, once I started doing my own company and I started moving around, I realized I can work from 
anywhere. I don't need to be at my desk all day. And I don't even want to be at my desk all day because it's not where I'm the most productive. So I realized that if I go out to a coffee shop or a, a different place, I have a change of scenery. Sometimes it sparks my creativity and it helps me to come up with ideas that I wouldn't have if I'm just sitting at my desk. So I think that that's one of the things that is really interesting because now people can work from anywhere and you can realize that people can be productive without having to be at a desk and chained to the desk at all times. And you can manage your teams in different ways. And mm-hmm. a, lot, a lot of the technology that's being used is really great in so many ways. I mean, now that we're all using Zoom, we're all, you know, connecting in and communicating in different ways. And I think that is a productive thing and that is going to ultimately help the industry. But I do think that a lot of, a lot was already wrong and it just made things to be more glaring. And the, the things like retail stores being able to cancel orders on designers, once the designer already produced the collection is not right. And so that the designers are just cutting out the retailers and going, fine, I'll sell it on my website and I don't even have to pay you a commission. So now the designers are able to sell directly to their customers. And that's not to say that I think stores aren't needed. I think stores are needed, but they need to have the right um, elements to their stores and they need to adjust their customer service and different things about the store to the times now. And like, like at Target, I can... I can place my target order and this is a thing that people do in places like Minnesota where you can drive. I drive over to the store and they put it in the back of my car. I click the drive up and I go and they put it in my car. So, you know, people need to think ahead like that. And I think that part of it is good for the fashion industry. And then another thing that is happening is diversity and people Mm. having diversity and their representation. And it totally angers me that it took George Floyd dying in my old neighborhood, South Minneapolis, for the fashion industry to wake up. And now the CFDA just put out a thing. Oh, we had the most diverse CFDA awards ever. And I'm going, why did it take George Floyd dying for for New York Fashion Week and for the CFDA to wake up, you know? This is this should have happened a long time ago, and I, as a part of my company and my tagline has always been, we celebrate diversity and size, and race and gender because I've been I've been that was a long time ago. You've been doing that for a long time. Floyd died. Okay, I had my tagline there because diversity in branding representation is hugely important. It's what young children are seeing when they are seeing images and how people are represented and how, and so it took too long for the fashion industry, in my opinion, to, and now they're kind of like, Oh, we have this diversity. Great. What else, you know, what are you really doing? I mean, I think the CFDA is making some good efforts. It just angers me that they're using diversity as a PR angle right now because it's the timing is just, you know, they should have done it a long time ago. So the, the, that's one thing that I'm, I'm so happy it's happening. I just think it's late. It's exhausting. You know, (laughs) I am glad that as a part of my company, I have been doing plus size, working with plus size. Yes. Going, you know what? Plus size can be really cool. And it used to be, have just this horrible connotation of bad clothes. And I started, and no editors wanted to hear about it either. And now, and since, you know, I, I've been doing it for, wow, you know, several years now where I started working with plus size brands and going, I'm going to pitch this same thing to a Vogue editor. Yeah. Or I'm going to pitch it to WWD or nylon or whatever. And I'm going to pitch it just as a brand, you know, yeah. and that the clothes are beautiful. So why shouldn't it be considered as a fashion label? It doesn't have to be put into the plus size category. It's, it's a brand, you know? Yeah. So that's something that I've been pushing myself for a long time. And, and something that I've been passionate about is showing um, people of different sizes and showing women uh, clothes that they can wear their high quality yeah, and in all sizes. And 
also working with gender fluid brands like yes. Knees on the Foe. What is so fabulous? Huge. Um, and Hardeman and the blondes yes. who are putting trans models on the runway, who are putting men in women's clothes, who are putting no no um gender on their no label clothing and that's been something that I've been doing for a long time since I started my own company. And, and even before that, because I've always been really passionate about it. And if a client wanted to do a runway show and wanted to do a cast of all white models, I would go and say, absolutely not. You know, yeah. you yeah. can't do that. And yeah. so, I mean, luckily my casting directors are all the people who hire the models are my friends and already would fight, they know. fight with me. Because they would already know, but sometimes a designer would come and go, oh, these are the, all the models I want. And you have to fight mm-hmm. back, you know, as PR people, you can't always just say, yeah, you're right to the designer. You have to say, absolutely not. This is bad for your brand. And this is what you should be doing. And so that's why I think a lot of these brands aren't working with the right PR people because yeah. the, the PR person should be, should have been a long time ago going, Hey, where's the diversity here? How come you have all white models on your page? You know, if I look at a brand on their Instagram and I see all white models and I get really disappointed, I actually get upset and I start commenting sometimes going, (laughs) I love this brand, but why are all of your models white? Like this. Oh, that's that Minnesota. Uh Uh-oh. That's yeah. not Minnesota. I mean, I, I can't <laughs> handle it. I, I get really upset about that. So, you know, I, I am happy that the industry is changing. I just, you know, I wish it happened before. Yeah. I am going to keep pushing for it on my side and pushing for diversity, pushing for plus size fashion to be fashion, to yeah. be a fashion. part of everything that everyone's doing that we have models of all sizes on the runway if we can i know it's difficult for designers to make samples of different sizes mm-hmm. but there's ways to do things yeah. to work around that and it's important and people should that. be putting their money into what's important and diversifying your brand and your casting is important and should be yeah. at the top of designers list i love that amen now this is called a fashion moment so the last question that I typically ask is what is your favorite fashion moment of all time? It can be personal or professional or both. Oh my gosh. There's so many amazing moments. There could be moments when, you know, when you're growing up, it could be, you know, some of that, you know, you lived with, it could be anything, just a very magical moment where you're just like, this is passion. I mean, I think for me, it probably was going to Paris fashion week for the first time because Paris fashion week is the ultimate fashion week. You know, it is. And when I went and I did a Vivian Westwood show in Paris, it just, it totally blew my mind. And Paris is where it's at. I mean, just being at Paris fashion week for me is absolutely the best fashion week I could I've ever been to it's the only fashion week I look at aside from New York fashion week when I want to really just look at the shows and see what's coming out it's my favorite so being on site at Paris fashion week working when I was just starting out my career was absolutely mind-blowing and I'll never forget it and I got to be to do an event at Paris fashion week with my own company when I first started my company. So that I, it was, um, trap star clothing, with this, which yes. is a really cool brand streetwear brand from London did a collaboration with Puma and they, Oh my God, I remember that. Paris. Yeah. And I got to go and, um, produce it and wow. do the PR and do the, I did the casting. I directed it. I worked with their team and just doing for me as a producer, producing my own event with these, with these guys who are awesome at Paris fashion week with, you know, also an iconic footwear brand Puma. That's pretty major. Amazing. Thank you so much. Emily, for being on the show. You're absolutely amazing. And your story is just so inspirational. I just love hearing it. I just love it. 
you. I'm Thank so you. happy to be a part of this. And congratulations to you. This is very Thank exciting. Thank you. We watch all of your series. Thanks so much for joining me for this week of A Fashion Moment. If you like what you hear, we'd love for you to join our community of listeners and spread the word about the show. We also want to hear from you. Share your favorite fashion moments and dream guests with us by sending an audio clip or email to a fashion moment podcast at gmail.com. Or you can tag us on Instagram at a fashion moment and you could be featured on next week's episode. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review and let us know what you think. Until then, see you next time for another fashion moment. Podcast production by Rebecca Rashid and John Taylor Williams. Digital media production by Megan Porras. This recording carries a Creative Commons 4.0 international license. Thanks to Patrick Patrickios for their song, Hot Coffee.